your response today, I know, was very meaningful yeah. to the three of you. It was very moving. Thank you, thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. So let's let's dive in. I'm going to start with Renata since we're sitting there. Um, questions out of order here. Okay, which one do you want? <laughs> Um, How did I write the movie? <laughs> yeah, you, you answer for each other, maybe that would yeah. be nice. Um, well, actually, Renata, why don't you tell us, uh, tell us about the first conversation you had with Joaquin about this movie. Do you remember the first conversation you had or how it started? Yeah, it was uh, a day after I decided to stop doing acting. <laughs> Because I've been in a lot of weird projects and uh, I was yeah theater for 20 years, so I um, I was uh, he called me the day after and then he asked me to do this this part and we, it wasn't really a conversation because I was so perplexed it was it was very yeah I was so honored and happy but uh, like uh, the next conversation, the conversation was better because it's actually about the script and the story and how. Uh, yeah, we had a conversation for five hours just based on the reading that I did of the script, and it was uh, just all. It was all about doing the nuances of uh, all the scenes because every scene is so rich. So it was. I think that was the baseline uh, for that talk. Well, I have to ask, though, you decided to stop acting? Yes. I was going to be a character. <laughs> Certainly not a bad, not a bad choice. Um, and I'm sure you could still do that. Have you, have you um, reconsidered after this performance? Yes. Which direction you're going to go? Um, I want to do like, like heavy lumberjack work. <laughs> but, uh, I'm going to have to wait a little bit, I think. A lot of stuff. Is I hope so. Yes, and I will build you something because I'm so grateful. <laughs> That's a quick follow up, and then we'll move yes. down the line here. Um, it must have been a an illuminating, maybe agonizing process to come to that decision to walk away from acting. Um, was that something that was building in you for a while, or how did that? It's a lot of uh, it's a lot of projects where it's it's a little. A little too little time, not enough money to finish the script. So uh, it's the whole system in Norway is very. You get very compromised. You never get to do stuff that, uh, or I didn't get to do stuff. I went into the profession to do. So this was the opposite of anything I've done before in film and uh, series, which is very little. So this is why I want to do it. Yeah. Anders, hello. Hello. Um, Good evening. Nice to see you back. Thank you. It's evening in Norway. It's not evening here. <laughs> Good enough. I'm a bit jet lagged, so yes. it's, like it's nice. almost morning in Norway yes. by now. <laughs> Anders, tell me about the first time you met the man to your right. Oh, um, that must have been when I came to the first audition for a priest. And that must have been in the spring of 2005. Yeah, so I was working in a, in a mental hospital a facility for young adults with um, uh, serious mental illnesses. And, and I got this uh, request to go to an audition for this uh, role that I was supposed to, to play a mental patient. And uh, I also, I had no plans of of working as an actor at that point. I had uh, one year left in, in med school, and um, so uh, you kind of changed my life there. <laughs> yeah, so long story short, uh, I ended up doing that part, and um, it was also the start of a, a long uh, friendship. What, Joaquin, what drew you to, to Anders? Do you remember the audition? I, I do actually. It was interesting. We were casting for reprise the role for, of two young men who were in their early twenties, and I said to the casting director, well, "I need to find people who are believable as writers that have that sort of intellectual capacity in their eyes, you know, the, the sense that they could actually be great writers." 
And after looking at like 500 young wannabe aspiring actors in Norway, I remembered the acting, uh, the, the, the casting director coming back to me and said, is it, I, I know you want them to look like writers, is it enough if they look like they've read a book? <laughs> and it was really hard finding someone that had that sort of intellectual project, you know, a sense about them, in lack of a better term. And I, I, and I remember uh, and one day they came in and said, do you remember that? children's film called Herman. I said, yeah, like that's a while back. It must be 15 years ago. Yeah, that guy who played Herman when he was 11, Anders Danielson Lee, who, who, who did that one role as a child. We just tried everyone. We were desperate. We took him in and he's not really an actor anymore. But we did some, we tried some stuff. Look at this tape. And I see Anders, uh, and one of the questions they asked you, did, did, did an interview and asked you what changed your life, like some piece of art, like a movie, book, uh, piece of music, and he said, oh, I saw Medea by Pasolini, and I started studying Greek, what a waste of time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, okay, it's a cool guy, okay, this is interesting, he's 23, you know, or something, and he's, you know, referencing Pasolini, and still having studied Greek, and so forth, and we went from there. <laughs> And by the way, he's still a doctor, so you know, the world didn't lose the medical profession because of him. He's still a practicing doctor. Let's switch gears. I'm going to ask like, maybe one more question, and we want to give some time to the audience. We talked about it backstage. We want to have a chance to ask, to let you ask a few questions. Um, Joaquin, maybe just lay the foundation for us a little bit on the writing process that led to the creation of this. Tell, tell us about the collaboration and about the kind of laying the foundation and the in initial ideas that, that instigated, ignited this film. Yeah, it's a big question. I'll, I'll try to answer it sort of as I recall. And, and I, um, I, I always write with someone called Eskil Fucht. He's a dear friend of mine and a dear friend of yours now as well. You know, someone who is... is um, I've collaborated with for a long time, and we wanted with this one to go a bit back, this film to go back to our roots and try to find a free form and talk about honest beats in the lives of humans in the sense that we, the liberation of doing chapters, for example, where you can try to, rather than to think it has to be a perfect dramaturgical structure, like we're more used to these days, than try to do something that has um, more like many songs on a record or something. You know, like pieces that will hopefully make sense together. And then to tell a story uh, of someone who's trying to somehow manage the space between imagination and romanticism and reality within the context of the theme of time, which is something we come back to. And I also knew I wanted to work with Dudenal that I'd say. Like, like, we wrote it for her. And I was also equally nervous asking you, and I'm, I'm happy I didn't ask like a year later, because it seemed we would have lost you. <laughs> <laughs> so that was a big part of it. Um, yeah, I, I, and, and the first ideas, yeah, many, many things that you know, we know Esco and I had in our pockets. We wanted, what happens if someone meets, you meet someone that you find attractive and you're in a relationship and you can't be unfaithful, what can you do? Like that, just imagining something like that. So boom, that's one song in the album. Another song, what happens if you imagine, oh, what if we could freeze time and run away for a moment and meet someone else and then come back and see and put time into play again? Or, you know, we had these things. But also like a fundamental idea was to, and to riff off a little bit this sort of we're Scandinavian, so we grew up with Bergman, you know, and, and what, what he inspires us to do sometimes is to be kind of ruthlessly intimate and honest about raw emotions and moments that are not idealized. And I think that the idea of your characters meeting at a hospital in the context of time is going to end for him and you being in the situation of being pregnant and having a type of conversation that could only arise under those circumstances. That idea, trying to build a story towards that, was, was also something we were, that was important to us. Okay, thank you. Um, I want to get to the audience. We have time for a few questions, if you can keep your question concise. Um, raise your hand, and we'll start there, and then raise your hand if you have others. So a question is for Renata about your work in the comedy. Uh, did this feel like a big transition? Yes, 
very much. In, in comedy, you don't, uh, you're not supposed to go that deep into the emotion, uh, and of course here it's like very deep into the emotion, and, and it's more like um, two-dimensional characters. But this character is, of course, so complex and rich. It's hard to even explain who she is because she's so many things. So uh, it's a very big transition. about surreal magical moments in a realist drama? Yeah, thank you. That's a good question. I, I guess uh, in the writing room, Eskil and I have one little yellow note on the wall <laughs> that keeps hanging there, <laughs> and it says, remember contrasts. And it's like the dynamic of things interests me in a scene, in a character, in a, in a narrative. The fact that you can play things in different directions and see whether it will still hold as a story, as in a one cohesive movie, you know, it's, it's so, I always look for way, oh sorry, are you okay? Do we have someone uh, on the right over here? <laughs> Everyone look. <laughs> um, I, I think that I'm trying to find um, ways to get into the head of the characters talk about interior events, whether it's through dialogue, great acting, um, you know, whether it's like creating a, a mushroom scene like this. I'm not particularly interested in drugs and cinema in itself, but it creates an opportunity to have someone, you can kind of access their unconscious, you know, and have some of those ideas of the longing for an ex or dealing with a father and all those things come into play. And, and I think in all my movies, I've tried to find ways of doing that. And sometimes it's, I think it's good to be literal and specific. Like if, if you look at Brian De Palma, you know, sometimes he, you know, the character thinks and you will see a fade in of what they're thinking. Oh, that glove I forgot, you know. And people say, oh, that's bad taste. No, that's, that's interesting, that's cinema too, you know. <laughs> Play around voiceovers and, and these things. I, I, I'm interested in that formal approach to trying to just convey thinking. Okay, let's go go right there. Yes, hi. I love the movie so much, and I'm so excited to watch it again. Um, how did you choose the same work time with Bruce's? Because I thought about shooting it. I about shooting the scene where time freezes for someone who really loved the film a lot. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, so. I mean, there's a lot of CGI going on right now, a lot of digital perfection, and I like things to breathe and be a bit messy, so we decided to do that frozen, um, we call it just the frozen part of the film. Uh, we did it in Oslo during a more, how should I say, slightly less restrictive part of COVID last year, so we were actually allowed to go out and film. And it, we all longed for that you know, that being together as a group, and it was like, those were, days were lovely actually. We were on set with tons of extras, and everyone had prepared how they would stand, where they would be, and, and, and you know, it, it was almost like doing a musical number. Because it was, you know, the, the, we had the, the, the local um, police help us like, stop the traffic, you have five minutes, everyone get into place, stand still, <laughs> run up, and run through. And, and those were great days for us, really fun, really great things to do. And it, there's no CGI in there, it's actually all shot as it is. And, and just that thing, since I was a kid, I made movies since before I could write. And this thing about creating an illusion. Whether it was as a child, you know, doing something with Lego and stop motion and having something very, very planned and constructed take life through moving pieces around, you know, beat by beat, image by image, or whether it's this kind of the most fun in the world of creating just this stupid illusion that time stands still. It's, it's a great joy. So thanks for the question. We, we, do you want to add something to that? I thought that was a Yeah, point. I love that you feel like old school. And I, I met so many people who were like, oh yeah, that was so annoying. The whole city was closed down. Because it was a big part of the city that was closed down. Like everyone was there at one point. Yeah. <laughs> it was fun for everyone. <laughs> okay, all the way back. Yes, hi, right there. Yes, you. First of all, that was so gorgeous. Thank you. And there's clearly so much.
much trust between director and actor in the way that this film shows itself. And the acting itself, there's so much breath and spontaneity in it. I'm wondering how much improvisation was encouraged or what were you very scripted? Yeah, well it's yeah, it's but it's it's uh, almost no improvisation. It's like the a very uh, good collaboration, like in. Yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll let you say something about this end because we came up with a term that I want you to explain in a second. But first of all, thank you very much for that statement and that question. And, I, and I, yes, I do feel we trust each other. And I think that going into the shoot, we plan and talk and, and get to know the material together. We share thoughts about it. And it's a real collaboration like that. And the script becomes better. I, Eskil and I rewrite always one version after we've had some rehearsal time. And, and so you, your input, it matters. Uh, Anders and I came up with, a while back when we did Oslo August 31st, this term we called a jazz take. And so, which is kind of in between improvisation and planning. Do, do you want to talk a bit about that? Yeah, so basically it's just, um, um, you have to be very well prepared. Um, uh, and the, the written scene should be, should be well prepared. And that's where the improvisation starts. Uh, you can't really, um, my experience, from my experience, you can't really improvise uh, successfully from scratch. You have to have some kind of core changes. Um, so I think um, that's uh, how we work. We try to to have some kind of direction and some kind of root, and then we sometimes paraphrase the the original uh, scene a little bit. But most of the time, I'd say we stick. Uh, pretty closely to the, uh, the the scene as it was written, but you want to have the best of both worlds. You know, you want to have the spontaneity and the the thinking and the the, com the um, composition that you can get when you write a scene. I think I think Anders is right. What we just specifically, since there might be other filmmakers here, what we try to do just to share that is is to do. A uh, few takes where we try to really nail the scene, you know, as it is, and sometimes that's that's great and wonderful. And we try to leave a moment for the end of an angle, a close-up, or a, or a, a, a version of a shot where where we do a looser version, where there is space for for you guys to play around with it a bit more. And, and sometimes we loop a section of the scene as well to go deeper into it and see if a, a moment arrives. That, that could kind of be interesting. So we're looking for an event, and how do you create an event? An event to me is something that uh, that could be planned, but it kind of just happens once, like a unique moment. That's the feeling you want, and you want every scene to have that, ideally. And that's about what Renato was talking about, like how we invest our money and how we work. It's actually a very pragmatic thing, like not having to nail too many pages a day and trying to leave some space for the actors to actually do their job. Yeah, that's what you do. Like, it's so important that you give, you fought to have time on set. Like, you really fought for it's that. It's very hard to build trust if you're always stressing everything. Because then you guys know, you, I, it's like my responsibility to catch you when you take a risk or you take a chance. And to keep in that risk space where you don't have to just nail it and move on. Like, the mental approach to that is important to try to sustain, even though we do have restrictions. Obviously, we don't have all the money in the world or anything, but, but that's, that's kind of where we, what we try to do. So, The Worst Person in the World is a Neon release. Thank you to our friends at Neon for sharing the film, and thank you to filmmakers tonight, today for being with us, sharing the film here at the festival, and thank you to the audience.